Wow. Thank you very much. My goodness. Hi, everybody. It's been a long day. It's been an exciting day. I spent the day out at Nike, and um, you know, I, Michael Brownguard and I sat down the other day and calculated our clients' annual business, and it just went over one trillion dollars a year. And we realized that this isn't a small thing that's going on; it's a rather big thing that's going on. And what's really exciting for me is that Nike is really at the very, very front edge of that. And it's a great blessing to be here in Portland with people. Uh, like the people at Nike, and, and just to see what they're doing, you have you have no idea, and uh, it's an amazing inspiration for businesses around the world, and uh, will be once it starts to roll out in real products and we start to see it. I think you'll be quite astonished at what's going on here, because it's a it's a highly creative act, and just do it turns out to be a great motto uh, in the world of creativity, because we need to come together as a species now. We need to think at that level and join together as a species and honor uh, those things about our species that make it unique. We ha are creative, we have intentions, and we need hope. So I'd like to talk about creativity, intentions, and hope tonight, and I'd also like to talk as a designer. Um, everybody here is a designer in my book, and so I'd like to ask you all just for tonight to suspend whatever it is you do and join me as a designer as we try and deal with the issues that come to us today. Because what we see now in the world are tragedies. And every time you see a tragedy and you allow it to occur, you realize that as a designer, you might as well have intended for it to occur. Because it's no longer good enough to say, it's not part of my plan, because it means you have a de facto plan. It's the thing that happens because you have no plan. And so it's time to recognize that if we allow the tragedies we see in the making to continue, and if we participate in them actively, then essentially we have become strategically tragic as a species. And once you realize you're strategically tragic, that perhaps it's the only way to subvert a strategy of tragedy is to adopt strategies of change. And in this, there's great humility because we don't know what to do. And we have to honor the fact that we do not know what to do. Um, I think humility is important. As I mentioned today, all a designer has to do is reflect on the fact that it took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. <laughs> and you realize how humble our species can be. How smart are we? When did we figure out the wheel? And why did we have the word luggage? <laughs> oh well. Uh, so, so tonight I'd like you to join me as designer and I'd like you to, ask, you to ask yourself one question every time you think of your design solutions or your involvement in design. And here's the question. How do I love all the children of all species for all time? I think it's time for us to measure the manifestations of our design as manifestations of love. Because if we really look at the implications of the legacy of many of our decisions, we'd have to question our intentions. And we'd have to ask ourselves, are we really intending to do certain things? It's very important right now to, to do this strategically, and I think having had the great joy of being the dean at the University of Virginia for five years, um, I did step down. I'm, by the way, still a professor of architecture at the University of Virginia. Uh, I'm a full professor, and I an, have an endowed chair now at the Darden School of Business that was put together by the alumni to honor this agenda in business. And so out of 50 faculty at one of the nation's top business schools, 12 have now taken up sustainable business as their focus. I've also got the chair at Cornell, and along with Jane Goodall, Richard Leakey, Jock Derrida, and Octavio Paz. So we're looking at, at a very interesting notion that human beings and their relationship to art, culture, 
and experience is about to go through a, a massive transformation based on our understanding that we're just another species. Now strategically, we can go and look at Jefferson as I got to do every morning when I'd wake up in my house. My architect was Thomas Jefferson. And, and Michelle and I would look up at the coping and, the, and think, well, this guy was a pretty good designer. And we thought, and you have to be clear that Jefferson saw himself principally as a designer because he designed his own tombstone and on it only recorded the things he designed. It says Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, which matured into the Bill of Rights, and father of the University of Virginia. Notice that he doesn't record any of his activities. No mention of having been president, minister to France. He only records his legacies, not his activities. So as designers tonight, consider your legacies, consider what it is that you will leave to your children as the only form of your immortality. And imagine the stories that you will tell, because in the end, the thing we share is our stories. When Gregory Bateson was coining the term cybernetics back in the late 60s in a book called Mind and Nature, he asked the computer in the book, he said, this is back when Hal is singing Daisy Daisy in 2001, it's a long time ago, before the web. And he says, tell me, computer, when do you think computers will begin to think like humans? And there's a really long pause, and the computer says, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> and so what is our story? And what will we tell the children? What is our design assignment? Let's go to Jefferson, because it's important to go to Jefferson again. We realize that the Declaration of Independence as a design assignment would represent quite an astonishing challenge. Just the mere fact that somebody would think that this is something they had to spend their life doing is an astonishing thing. Can you imagine Jefferson waking up every morning going, oh, I've got to work on that stupid declaration. Imagine. Imagine the kind of assignment this designer is giving to himself. And what was that design assignment? Give it to yourselves. Design the Declaration of Independence. Imagine the impact of this. All men, women, children, species are created equal. Imagine. Now, what would the design assignment be? It would be, could you create a document that calls for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness free from remote tyranny? Free from remote tyranny. Now, in his case, remote tyranny was represented by a person somewhere else making decisions about a local circumstance about which they knew little and cared less, probably. This was untenable, unacceptable, remote tyranny across place, across space. And I think that if Thomas Jefferson were to return today, she would be calling for declarations of interdependence. And the questions would be the same. How can we celebrate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Can you imagine Congress debating the use of the word happiness in a bill? <laughs> life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness free from intergenerational remote tyranny. Tyranny across time. And clearly Jefferson understood this. He, Thomas Jefferson, and studied the Iroquois Confederacy for its governmental structure. We know that Benjamin Franklin spoke Mohawk. And so we realize they must have also been aware of the instructions of the great peacemaker who instructed the chiefs to make all decisions on behalf of their seventh generation, even if it requires you to have skin as thick as the bark of a pine. That's the second half. Don't eat your seed corn. Jefferson understood this. It's interesting to note that the people in this room are Thomas Jefferson's seventh generation. He designed the Declaration of Independence for us. And it's time for us to take our responsibility towards our seventh generation. He clearly understood this because the issue has to do with living as if there's going to be a tomorrow and designing for tomorrow within an ethical frame. 
let's take a look at this for a second. He said in a letter to James Madison, an astonishing letter, he said, the earth belongs to the living. The earth belongs to the living. No man may by natural right oblige the lands he owns or occupies to debts greater than those that may be paid during his own lifetime. Because if he could, then the world would belong to the dead and not to the living. The world would belong to the dead. I was at a conference in Atlanta. Ted Turner got up and said, the problem in the world comes down to the population. There are now six billion people here. The resources we have can only service two billion. Four billion people have to go. He can afford to say this, he has six children. But the terrifying part of this for me as a designer is that we have to design to love every single one of those children that is going to be born. The minute we say that one of them doesn't have 100% right to be here and be loved, then human rights has no meaning. It's not love most of the children. Every single one. And if environmentalists get into this discussion of population and they cross this line, then a terrifying thing begins to happen. And I think part of the problem is that the way the Bill of Rights has been interpreted as the right to be free from someone else keeping you from doing something. And what we realize is that the Bill of Rights as a structure should be reconsidered at this point in our history, seven generations later. Because as Rachel Carson pointed out, the Founding Fathers would never have put in the right of a company to pollute a river and chill, kill children downstream. They would never have given the right to a business to pollute the air, to double glaze the planet. Because they would never have imagined that we would do such a thing. And when I work with companies and we look at our products and our systems and we ask them, why are you doing this? 16 known carcinogens, 12 known teratogens, 3 known mutagens, 4 suspected endocrine disruptors. And their answer is, it's not against the law. Is this design? Is this the best we humans can do at this point in our history? When an architect tells me they've met the code, what am I supposed to do? Say congratulations? Are you trying to tell me you would have, would have done worse if you could have? <laughs> Is the minimum your maximum? At what point do we understand that if Thomas Jefferson were to return today, she would be asking for a bill of responsibilities? And that a regulation is a signal of design failure. Because as Jane Jacobs has pointed out, human beings have evolved two syndromes of survival, what she calls the guardian and commerce. Now the guardian, which is the state, the university, the knights of the round table, is very slow, it's very serious, it wants to preserve itself, it's a guardian of the public interest. And, and it reserves certain rights to itself, for example, it reserves the right to kill. It will go to war if you threaten it. It reserves the right to be duplicitous. The CIA is legal. Commerce, on the other hand, is quick, it's inventive, and it's honest. But the guardian must shun commerce. The guardian has to shun commerce. Imagine this. When, as a dean, you could come to me and say, I'd like to give you a million dollars to put my kid in your school. And I would say, I shun commerce. Sir Lancelot was not a tailor on the side. The guardian shuns commerce. This is why everybody's so interested in what they talk about in the Lincoln bedroom over coffee. If commerce was never given the right to kill. So from our perspective, a regulation is the state stepping into a business saying, wait, 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 we reserve the right to kill. 
if you want to kill children and destroy brain cells, we reserve these rights. We never gave you these rights. We will give you the license to dispense this destruction. And so a regulation slows down business, and it's a signal of design failure. If business gets into, into, the, reg, into, the, um, into the Guardian, it corrupts it. So we like to work in commerce because it's quick, it's creative, and it's honest. Jane Jacob says that anything that combines these two becomes what she calls a monstrous hybrid. A good example would be the mafia reserves the right to do business and kill. So keep the two separate. So we work in commerce. And so we look at this idea of, of rights and our, our right to be free from regulation, not because we want to destroy things, because a, reg, a warning right now is part of the design as far as a product liability is concerned. And so you're allowed to sell anything as long as you give a warning with it. Here is your carpet. It includes cancer, birth defects, endocrine disruption, heavy metals, persistent toxification, bioaccumulative substances and endocrine disruption. Jefferson's third design, the University of Virginia, is still there, and it's based on the premise of what he calls the clash of ideas, that he understood that there needed to be a clash of ideas, that we had to really engage viscerally, and that you stayed in the university as long as you were learning, and then you left. There were no degrees. There was no grading. You were there for the love of knowledge, and when you had what you needed, you left. Now, if we look at this, we realize that something is going on today that's different, and that we, we really do need to sort of imagine a new platform of thought, a new platform of activity, and it's a very exciting and delightful moment. And if my back didn't hurt so much, I'd, I'd probably be jumping up and down, because the work we're doing is fun. But it's different. And the platform is different. When I open my course at the university, we, um, I bring in Oren Lyons, the faith keeper of the Onondaga, who's an old and close friend. And Oren begins my course by looking out at the audience and saying, what you people call your natural resources, my people call our relatives. And so the question isn't necessarily, do we have dominion over the world? Because in many ways we do. And the question isn't even necessarily do we have stewardship over those elements over which we actually have dominion because uh, stewardship is implicit in dominion. The earth belongs to the living. How could you have dominion over something that's dead? So stewardship's still implicit in dominion, but it's also still anthropocentric. And so the real question has to be, how do we find ourselves in kinship with nature? How do we find ourselves as a meaningful, rightful, natural part of nature itself. So that instead of us talking about all these eco-efficiencies and natural capitalisms and things like that, still capitalisms, it's maybe natural capitalism, but the real question is when do we stop using everything as our tool and start to understand how we relate to the natural system so that we allow nature to use us as her tool? That, I think, will be an astonishing design moment. And it's really an evolution of our understanding of the whole concept of rights, because as you look at the history of rights, you can go back in our tradition to Magna Carta, noble males, the Declaration of Independence, white landowning males, only 6% of the population, suffrage, or the Emancipation Proclamations in the 1800s, suffrage in 1922, Native Americans on board in 1923, and then you see uh, the Civil Rights Acts in the 60s, and in 1973, uh, we give the right to something other than humans to act with the Endangered Species Act. And I think today our discussions are evolving around endangered ecosystems. And so as we expand our own understanding of the rights, of the whole concept of rights and responsibilities, it's going and getting broader and broader to encompass this actual world in which we live, which has laws by which it operates. And it's interesting to know that when you talk about natural laws, you know, I once said uh, to my students that gravity is not just a good idea, it's the law. And so when we break nature's laws, uh, there are consequences. 
So let's take a look at nature and natural rights. What is nature? What are natural laws? What are the net rights of nature and, and the natural rights? Nature itself is a very interesting framework of, of co a concept because we keep hearing terms natural step, natural rights, what natural capitalism, so on. What is, that, what is this natural thing anyway? What is this world about? And that's a fundamental area to be thinking about. Emerson, you know, our first major transcendentalist, started looking at, at nature for Harvard in 1838, wrote an essay entitled Nature, and in it he asked the question, if human beings are natural, are therefore all things made by humans part of nature? And his conclusion was that nature is all those things that are immutable, unchangeable, what he called the unchangeable essences, the oceans, the mountains, and the leaves. Well, I think here we are, this, you know, this is at the cusp of the first industrial revolution, and now, thanks to Jacques Cousteau, we realize we can affect the oceans, we can certainly affect the mountains, we can certainly affect the leaves, and we realize that we do have this kind of strange dominion, and that, and that actually nature is mutable, and that we are in this incredible relationship to it, but we've also understood today that it isn't that Mother Nature is so big that we can throw things in the ocean and just hope they'll disappear because she's so big she can handle it the way an infant would treat the mother. The infant is not worried about the mother's well-being. The mother is there. If she's not feeling well, that's not the infant's problem. I mean, it is, but it isn't part of their, their basic consciousness. And so, so this idea that we now recognize that away has gone away. Remember you could throw things away? We can't throw things away anymore. There is no more away. Away went away, as Gertrude Stein might say. <laughs> so we threw away away. And, and so we realized, as Thoreau did, I think, that, that we are now integrately connected, and now our delight is to find those synaptic spaces that we actually occupy within nature. And we can study the notion of our designs in relation to that synaptic space. So what is design? In 1831, Emerson went to Europe on a sailboat, and he came back in a steamship. This is design. From an abstract perspective, he went over on a solar-powered, recyclable vehicle operated by craftspeople practicing ancient arts in the open air, and returned in a steel rust bucket, putting smoke in the sky, oil on the water, operated by people working in the darkness, shoveling fossil fuels into the mouths of boilers. And guess what, folks? We're still designing steamships. We're in one right now. The sun could be shining out there, but we'd never know it. We're in the dark, producing nuclear isotopes and global warming. Well, we talk about producing nuclear isotopes and global warming in the dark. It's time for a new design. And the leadership must come from you. As Peter Senge says, who is the leader on a ship crossing the ocean? It's the designer of the ship. You could be the best captain in the world, but if the ship isn't designed to be seaworthy, you're going down. It's time for leaders to become designers, designers to become leaders. We all have to do this together. Let's get on with it. Because there comes a point in everyone's life where they recognize the strategies of tragedy and they decide at which level they wish to engage these strategies from a personal perspective. Today, for the first time, I decided to talk to the Nike people about my own background, and, and um, I found it rather useful. I hadn't really thought about what brought me to this place. So I'd like to share that with you. I was born in Tokyo, Japan in 1951, and I spent most of my childhood in Hong Kong. This is before the pipeline was there from the mainland, right after all the refugees had arrived from China in 1949. Four million people on 40 square miles mostly in refugee camps. Every time we'd have a monsoon, we'd lose a hillside and we'd lose 100,000 people. I thought this was ordinary life. During the dry season, we had four hours of water every fourth day. You filled your bathtubs, every pot, every glass. People died of cholera on our doorstep, ringworm, typhoid fever, typhus, yellow fever. I thought this was ordinary life. When I'd go with my mother to the money changers to change my dad's paychecks, so she would hold me by the hand and I would be at eye level with an 80-year-old woman whose begging device was a baby that was dying. The baby was usually a girl and the baby would die and she'd have a new baby every month. I thought this was ordinary life. We spent the summers in the Puget Sound my grandfather had won the Yukon Lottery. 
and he was a lumberjack. And he bought old growth forest and built a log cabin and raised oysters with my grandma. And they saved rubber bands and aluminum foil. And I thought that was ordinary life. Then in 1963, when the Seagram building was built in New York, my father became the president of Seagram overseas, their international wines and spirits business. And we moved to New York. And I lived in Westport, Connecticut, and where 16-year-olds had Porsches. And I thought that was ordinary life. But you realize at some point that we had become consumers with lifestyles instead of people with lives. And then when did we become consumers with lifestyles, and why would we do that? And I think it connects to the nuclear threat, because if you really look at it, we were living as if there was no tomorrow. Because if you spend your life diving under your desk, expecting the world to end in a flash, that perhaps it is time to party up. Perhaps living as if there is no tomorrow actually came because we created the condition wherein we could have no tomorrow. And I think today with the Cold War ending and the hope that we bring, especially in the sustainable development agenda, the idea is that there might be a tomorrow. And perhaps it's time for us to redesign our systems so that there will be a tomorrow. And if we're going to do that, we're going to need to do it around the concept that we love all of our children. Because they do represent our immortality. I mentioned during the question period today at Nike that in ancient Irish cosmology, there are four worlds. There's this one, and then the next one is called Fairy, which is where the little people and the banshee and giants are and so on. And the way they describe Fairy is that it's exactly the same as this world. It's just a little bit better. This is a melancholy race. And we might be in fairy all the time. I try and spend as much time there as possible. Uh, you go in and out of it all the time because it looks just like this. When you wake up in a beautiful day and you go, oh, you could be in fairy. Well, okay. Now, the next world is called, um, is called um, the land of the forever young, Tirnanog. And to get to Tirnanog, you have to suspend disbelief and you have to go underwater. You have to drown to go into the darkness, and you can look back out at this world. We can't see it, it can see us, and people have traveled back and forth. This is Persephone myth, obviously. And so, but what's interesting is that the forever young have interesting characteristics. They call us the immortals, because we can have children. If you're forever young, you don't have children. And they expect to be annihilated in an instant. They're waiting for Armageddon. And so we are the immortals. And our immortality is vested in the fact that we can have children. In 1974, I built the first solar heated house in Ireland while I was a student at Yale, which will give you a sense of my ambition. There's no sun in Ireland. <laughs> um, I had support from NASA and Pilkington Glass and Yale, and it worked great. It still does. 1984, I designed the National Headquarters for Environmental Defense Fund in New York, the first of the so-called green offices in New York. And, um, and we started looking at building materials because our client had said if anybody in his office got sick, they'd sue us. And so we started looking at materials, and we started contacting all the manufacturers and saying, what's in your products? What are you off-gassing? Where do your products come from? What are the forestry protocols you're using? So on and so forth. And the answers we got from everybody were, it's proprietary, it's legal, go away. Two weeks ago, Ford Motor Company sent a letter to all their major suppliers saying, we're adopting MBDC protocol. We'd like you to take this on. And all of a sudden you realize that it, this is a company that spends $140 billion a year buying stuff. Everybody in the stock market or its shareholders are interested in the fact that they make 7 to $10 billion a year in profits. And I think that's really interesting too. But the part that interested me is that they spend $140 billion a year. This can move markets. This is very exciting stuff. In 1987, I was asked by the Jewish community in New York to design a memorial of the Holocaust at Auschwitz. So I went to Auschwitz in Birkenau, the camp right there that was designed as a giant killing machine. And as a designer, I broke down. I stood there in this place, a circle surrounded by barbed wire and razor wire, one mile 
in diameter, full of barracks and facilities that had names like crematoria, gas chamber. And you realize that designers had come together to imagine the worst of human intention. They had designed railheads where the people got off on one side and went in straight into gas chambers on their way to crematoria. And they were trying to determine what the body fat content of humans should be and how to stack it so it would burn most efficiently. And on the other side, they designed it so that people would come off these cattle cars and they would go into, into the slave labor camps to be used by Ige Farben and for production and for testing of cosmetics in human eyes. Forget animal testing. The cosmetics that we wear today were tested on human eyes in Auschwitz. And you start to realize that as a designer, there has to be a point at which a designer says, I don't do this. I don't participate in this. This is not something I can do. And once I understand what's going on, then you realize that negligence is when you know better and you do it anyway. And we're not asking people to feel guilty because I don't think guilt really helps us in our personal lives either. But it, it really does matter that we understand that there is the notion that negligence starts tomorrow. And the most terrifying thing to me is to realize that in the making of a standard office building today, when you walk in and you see sealed glass buildings with the materials that are being brought in, and we study these materials and the molecules, we realize that the, most of the designers are still designing gas chambers. We're putting people in chemical experiments. We have no idea what, what we're intending, and we're, call it, we're not calling it science. We call it design. We call it architecture. We call it the making of things, and we call it legal. We call it legal. And at some point you have to ask yourself, when do you say, I don't do this anymore? In 1991, I was asked by the city of Hanover, Germany, to write the design principles for the World's Fair that will happen there next year. We heard yesterday there will be no U.S. pavilion. We anticipated that in the principles. It said, why would any company want to be part of a U.S. pavilion? Because companies aren't going to be, want to be U.S. anymore. They're international companies. IBM is not American. They don't want to be perceived as a U.S. company. So there, were no, there was no economic support for a U.S. pavilion. We are not going to show up. So now the Hanover Principles will be America's contribution to the World's Fair. The Germans went out when they won the bid for the fair based on the theme humanity, nature, and technology. And here we are, the exact same culture. And they were asking a new question. They went out and said, who can help us think about the future relationships with human, from human beings having the best of intentions? The same culture going from the worst to the best of intentions. And what we realize is that best of intentions will not involve efficiency. Everything that we see in the world that involves the best doesn't involve efficiency. Isn't that interesting? Van Gogh was not efficient. Mozart was not efficient. If Mozart was efficient, he'd get all the notes and play them at once. Kaboom! <laughs> How efficient. Time to go home. Figaro never got married. And what we realize is that the joy in the world is based on a very complex series of relationships and that if your system is designed and it's dangerous, for example, Nazism, then an efficient system that's dangerous is more dangerous than an inefficient system. An efficient Nazi is more terrifying than an inefficient Nazi. And that the joy in the world has to be celebrated from a whole other set of levels, a whole other set of relationships. So let me read you the principles. Insist on the rights of humanity and nature to coexist. This is 1991. It's before the Earth Summit. Recognize interdependence. Respect the relationships between spirit and matter. More on that later. Accept responsibility for the consequences of design. Create safe objects of long-term value. Eliminate the concept of waste. 
This does not say minimize waste. It says eliminate the entire concept of waste. This has now been picked up by uh, quite a number of people and we're very pleased to see it being used. Rely on natural energy flows. Understand the limitations of design. 5,000 years. Wheels. Luggage. Seek constant improvement by the sharing of knowledge. Now, if you look through this book, it says things like we need things like products of service. We need t nutrients for our systems. We need waste equals food. There's all sorts of strategies in here, but they're, what they're about is a very exciting and fecund world of relationships that honors our very creative genius as, as people and our understanding of the need and desire to find our place in the world. When the Germans saw the spirit matter one, they said, you know, they're all fine except for this one. It's too fuzzy. There's no science. And we said, well, that's, you know, that's interesting. It's number eight. I think we should make it number five. Because when I went around the world, the native peoples who reviewed these principles with me came back and said, there is only one principle. It is that one. And they said, no, you don't understand. We're trying to get rid of it. And I remembered Picasso's negotiating technique. How many of you guys know Picasso, how he did it? His art dealer came to see him in his garret and said, you know, how much for this picture? And he said, 200 francs. The dealer said, oh, I'll give you 100 for it. And Picasso said, oh, we're negotiating 400. <laughs> the guy became his dealer. So he said, well, let's make it number three. And they said, oh, I see where this is going. So it's there. But what we realized is, look at the genetic modified material discussion. We're, we're convening through my institute in a, a large meeting on the ethics of genetic engineering because they don't have, uh, there is no ethical code of conduct in the genetic engineering industry. Even the chemical industry has a code of responsible care. And the way we got everybody to pay attention to this, we asked a very simple question. We said, at what point are Hindus unable to eat American food? It's not a question of can you do this. If you mix bacteria with plants, you're doing things God never tried to do. You're crossing kingdoms. At what point can you cease to be a vegetarian? If we develop sera for humans and pigs and we eat pork, at what point are we cannibal? There are fundamental questions here. There are questions of spirit and matter. Let me give you your next design assignment. While I'm giving it to you, I'd like you to consider the ethics of my request. I would like you to imagine that you are strategically engaged in, the, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, profound outcome for the system, that you're engaged in it, trying to make it into the most productive thing you possibly can. I would like you to design a system of production which is essentially the first industrial revolution. Can you design a system that treats nature as your enemy? measures productivity by how few people are working, progress by your number of smokestacks, and if you're especially proud, put your names on them, measures prosperity by how much of your natural capital you can cut down, dig out, bury, burn, or otherwise destroy, requires thousands of complex regulations to keep you from killing each other too quickly, destroys biological and cultural diversity, and while you're at it, produce a few things so highly toxic They'll require thousands of generations to maintain constant vigilance while living in terror. Can you do this for me? Does it make you want to get up in the morning? Let's go do this. What kind of system is this? And what kind of principles are in, act in action here? It appears to me that the only design principle underlying this effect would be that if brute force isn't working, you're not using enough of it. It's time for a new set of principles. It's time for the next industrial revolution. We're really honored at how many people have picked this up, this term, these ideas, and are taking them forward. And here's your new design assignment. Design a system that treats nature as your friend. That measures productivity by how many people are meaningfully engaged. That measures progress by your number of buildings that don't have any pipes. That measures prosperity by how much of your natural capital you can accrue, how much solar energy you can accrue for your benefit and that of future generations safely. That doesn't require complex regulations because you're not trying to kill each other anymore. 
that celebrates and enhances and encourages biological diversity, cultural diversity, not one size fits all, and doesn't produce anything that causes intergenerational remote tyranny. Can you do that for me? This is fun. Let me show you some of the work. I, well, I'm, what was your name again? Cherie. Cherie. Thank you. Cherie is going to help me here. Our principles are three. Waste equals food. Use current solar income and respect diversity. Waste equals food. is eliminate the concept of waste. Everything is a nutrient. I'll get into that in a minute. Use current solar income. Nature doesn't mind the past or mortgage the future. It works from current income. And respect diversity. I'm going to be focusing on the, the top one there, but before I do, let me, let me just focus on this diversity issue. There's a lot of discussion about biological diversity, cultural diversity, and these are really critical issues. And from a design perspective, you have to understand how these fit. And it helps me to, under, to use the current solar income to show you how this fits together from a design perspective. If we go back to the primordial moment on our planet, and we think about the theory of relativity as a theory of relevation, and we realize that E equals MC squared is an astonishing scientific revelation. And that if we take the M and call that mass and think about water and rock, and we think about a planet that's water and rock, and then we think of E as energy and we think of physics and chemistry. So we have chemistry here on the planet, we have physics out here in space, and all of a sudden E meets M at the speed of light, and guess what happens? Magic. Biology. Biology, from a design perspective, is the merger of physics and chemistry. And this astonishing thing happens that no scientist has yet explained, which is the single photosynthetic cell. And all of a sudden, here we are on this planet, physics meets chemistry, and all heaven breaks loose. And we've got this incredible explosion of fecundity driven by the sun, and all of a sudden it's niche after niche after niche getting created, solar-driven chemistry-physics merger. And the world gets fecund, and it's more and more niches. And Darwin has been misinterpreted, certainly by the business community, who talk about survival of the fittest. That's not what he meant. Read Origin of Species. What he meant was survival of the fitting guest. And that fundamentally what's going on is the evolution of species is developing more and more niches, more and more fecundity. It's more and more and more and more. And along come human beings, and guess what? Less is more. And all of a sudden, it's less and less and less and less. Ask Monsanto, one species of corn. Think about it. It's less and less and less. Look at the architects. One kind of building, the same building in Reykjavik or Rangoon. We heat one, we cool the other. Right? We just add what I call the black sun. Right? I, I gave the opening address to the largest gathering of architects in history, 10,000, and in Chicago. McCormick Place, and I walked out in the audience, and the first thing I said to 10,000 architects is, how many people in this room know how to find true south? True south. I got four hands. How many people in this room know how to find true south? You see what I mean? It's pretty incredible, isn't it? When did we forget where the sun was? Of course, you have an excuse out here. When did we have this incredible cultural amnesia? All of a sudden, our buildings face willy-nilly. We, add, we add en just add energy. Isn't that something? And we completely lost this notion of diversity. You go around any city in the world like this, and you wouldn't even know what country you're in anymore. Isn't that something? So it's time to respect diversity, to respect that, that unbelievably unique expression that nature has given us an opportunity to explore and to celebrate it, not to constantly minimize and so on and so forth. More on this later. We've added to the criteria for decision making. The typical decision criteria are cost, performance, aesthetics. Can I afford it? Does it work? Do I like it? At architecture school, we reverse this aesthetics, performance, cost. But it's still the same three. <laughs> right? Now, to this, we've added uh, is it ecologically intelligent? Is it just? And is it fun? Fun is really important, and this is fun, I must tell you. It is fun. 
So those are the criteria. You just saw the principles. Now, if waste equals food, then everything's a nutrient. If everything's a nutrient, then it belongs in a metabolism. Well, what are the metabolisms of the world? What we've seen is there's the biological metabolism, which is the one we physically inhabit, and then there's the technical metabolism, where chemistry and physics act, and that's really uh, the in industry, industrial uh, cycles. So we design for the biological or technical cycles, and then that would mean a product is either a product of consumption, because you can truly consume it, and it can go into biological cycles, or it's what we call a product of service, which is something from which you want the service, but it belongs in the technical cycles forever. Now this gets very interesting, because a product of service you effectively want to lease, because you don't necessarily need the ownership of this thing, you just want the utility. Imagine I had a television set behind this podium, and I said, I have an astonishing item, it provides incredible service. But before I tell you what it does, let me tell you what it is, and you tell me if you want this in your house. It's 4,360 chemicals, it has highly toxic heavy metals, it has an explosive glass tube, and we think you ought to put it at eye level with your children and encourage them to play with it. <laughs> Do you want this in your house? Why are we selling people hazardous waste? What you want to do is watch TV, not own hazardous waste. So what we're saying to the industries is design these as products of service. So when you finish with it, you take it back, you de-shop it, and you say thank you so much for the service of your TV, your carpet, your computer, your car, whatever, shoe. And uh, I finished with the utility of this in its present life. I'd like a new one, please. So these things need to be designed for intelligent disassembly. They need to be designed as technical nutrients that can be recycled forever. In the shoe industry, this would mean that Imelda Marcos could be go guiltless, because every time she bought a new pair of shoes, all she'd be doing is creating jobs. And so you start to realize that we can actually design into these protocols that in healthy ways, and it's very critical for us to develop a whole synthetic approach for human creativity that recognizes the value of, of synthetic uh, articulation because uh, scientifically created materials are actually critical to our survival. If everybody in the world wore Birkenstocks and cotton, the world would dry up and we would run out of cork instantaneously. We actually need technical products desperately in order for us to have a world where we survive in nature. Now, this is not eco-efficiency, and Michael Brongart and I wrote an article for Atlantic Monthly which caused a huge stir. In fact, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development convened a, group, a big conference and, uh, to figure out what to do about us because uh, we basically took on the eco-efficiency model, which has been a great thing, and we've had wonderful proponents. Uh, for a long time, factor four, factor ten, this is really exciting. In fact, the instigation of, uh, of natural capitalism came from Amory's factor four book, when I was actually had a working title of factor ten, and then I think now it has re recognized that this notion of actually going beyond these factors is a critical one. And so we're, we're really interested in the idea of looking at, the, at a new agenda, which is the title of tonight's talk, uh, eco-effectiveness, celebrating abundance. Because the problem with eco-efficiency, which is the fundamental response of the environmental movement to the business community at the Earth Summit, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, is a very good one. It's very important. We have to be less bad. But if that's it, I don't know what kind of legacy we're leaving here. Because from a design perspective, the legacy of this, the design assignment, is feel 100% bad. Try and spend your day feeling better by being less bad, and your goal is zero. Can you imagine giving that to your kid as a legacy? Here you go, kid. Feel bad. Try and feel better by being less bad. Your goal is zero. Go for it. <laughs> what kind of legacy is this to leave people? And then you realize that there's a fundamental paradox here, which is that as I get less bad, wait a second. Yeah, as I get less bad, as I, gave, I gave the closing address to Environment Protection Agency's 3350 Voluntary Toxics Reduction Program, and the, Monsanto received an award for reducing their toxic emissions by 90% over five years. And the two questions that had to occur during the final wrap-up were, one, what were you doing in the first place? <laughs> and two, now that you've reduced it by a factor of 10, but we used to worry about parts per million, and now it's parts per trillion with endocrine disruption. So while you've reduced it by a factor of 10, the problem went up by a factor of 10,000. So now the problem is only 1,000 times bigger, and you have a new 1,000%. And so what you realize is eco-efficiency is Zeno's paradox. We'll never get there. We'll just give ourselves a whole new series of 100%, and we'll never reach our targets, because we haven't changed the story. 
If I leave here, I can go north to Canada, I can go south to Mexico. If I find myself going 100 miles an hour towards Mexico, but I'm supposed to be going to Canada, it's not going to help me to slow down to 20. <laughs> I'm going the wrong way. Now, if, it's sl if slowing down helps me turn around, that's interesting. But let's get on with it. So what we're saying is eco-effectiveness celebrates the abundance of nature, not the limits. And let's just say we're 10% sustaining, not sustainable. And we'd like to be 100% sustaining, which means we have to use our creative imaginations to imagine what that might look like. Now we can measure our progress towards it and say, tomorrow I'd like to be 11%. Because nature is not efficient. You don't look at a cherry tree in the spring and say, oh my God, how many blossoms does it take? A cherry tree is not efficient. It's delightful. And it's safe. All those blossoms go back to the soil to become cherry trees and other things again. And we start to realize, look at the men in this room, right? A hundred million sperm each in case two get lucky. Right? You're not very efficient. But you're effective. <laughs> and it's fun. And so you realize that we should be celebrated. Van Gogh was not effect efficient. Peter Drucker has a whole book called The Effective Executive, and the first point he makes is that executives aren't meant to be efficient. Being extremely efficient at doing the wrong thing is absolutely the worst thing you could possibly do. A job of an executive is to be effective. The right people doing the right things at the right time in the right place. That's effective. And so let's get on with trying to figure out what those things are. Fortunately, you've got Nike here being the right people, doing the right things in the right way, in the right place, and it's pretty exciting. And because what it does is change the story. You see, right now, the story is demeaned. It says, over time, this is the science part of the talk here. I'm obviously not a scientist. Um, but over time, we're using too much stuff. So time over stuff. Here we go. All right, we're using too much stuff over time, so we see the tragedy. We're going to run out of stuff. So eco-efficiency says, oh my God, we have to use less stuff over time. The only problem is I don't know any business person who likes this chart. They've all been trained to hate this chart. And uh, not only that, it doesn't change the story. This says we have to make twice as many tree, uh, you know, cardboard boxes out of the trees in Indonesia. It doesn't change the story. It's still good by Indonesia. It just might take a little more time. We have to be careful because if we end up just simply substituting one thing for another, if we get twice as many miles per gallon, but we have hyper people driving in hyper cars on hyper highways, uh, it's not going to necessarily help us to double the mileage. We really need to look at the whole system. We need to develop a kind of fecundity within the system that changes the, the whole strategy. And so that story changes like this. What we need to do is turn time into stuff, turn stuff into intelligence, because hopefully on our y-axis, people would rather not get more and more stupid. So the idea is to go in for increasing intelligence, and we'll make the line itself time. So over time, we're using more and more stuff. We recognize the tragedy, but we're getting smarter and smarter and smarter. So guess what happens? We start to sequester materials into technical cycles and into biological cycles so that a carpet is effectively leased. The largest carpet, in the company, a country, uh, carpet company in the world for commercial carpets has adopted our protocol of product of service. And so when you buy their, get their carpet, you would be basically getting the comfort, the appearance, the service of the carpet. But at some point, when you finish with its utility, it goes back and it's designed to become a carpet again. So that instead of destroying the world, you just change the color of your carpet and, get, and create jobs. And then things are going to biological cycles, and then this allows us to leave the rest of the world alone. Now, from the development of business models, we realize that same fecundity that nature has given us as a model can be applied to our own business protocols, and we can start to imagine a new product, realize we have to go through a learning curve to figure out how to make it, or be it, like a robin needs to figure out their worms in the front yard, an architect has to learn how to be an architect, it's a 10-year process, a new kind of shoe, a new kind of furniture, whatever. It's a learning curve and you invest. And then you find your niche, and you inhabit your niche. But as soon as you inhabit a niche profitably, guess what happens? All the other species start showing up going, that's cool. Worms in the front yard, got it. Mockingbirds, starlings, everybody shows up. And now you're competing at margins. And so you start to realize if you're an open office furniture system like Herman Miller, there's Steelcase, Hayworth, 
you know, Noel, everybody shows up, your margins are down to 3%, it's time to reimagine yourself because you see the tragedy coming. And so in the big businesses, what we see is consolidations of the major industries, banking, insurance, automobiles, they're going to be three companies, you know, because they have to, sh they have to uh, become very efficient. Or you reinvent yourself. The problem is you can't reinvent yourself uh, at the last moment because in today's marketplace you can't fund that research with that much momentum and flatline for any length of time. Stock markets are unforgiving on that. So we don't have family businesses. So basically what happens, we're saying to our clients, it's time to reinvent yourself very early, long before the tragedy occurs because that way you can use that research can be funded by that much momentum of your existing business. And when the tragedy starts to meet all your competition or the other occupants of the former niche, then you realize that you're already there. You have a new strategy and that the idea is for you to be as advanced in your strategic thinking. And this is what's known as leadership. It is also what's known as evolution. And our buildings do evolve, and our, our systems evolve, and our products evolve. I mean, hard drives have evolved from 14 and a half inches down to one inch. You know, they don't just sit still. And they have these disruptive technologies that are constantly in play because we're constantly evolving new niches. Nike created a niche with its shoes just to say that they might beat their own competition. They created that whole niche that, that didn't even exist before they created it. And what we realize is that typically we have been operating within a structure between capitalism and socialism and that any ism is a dangerous thing. It's too extreme. Nazism, fascism, sexism, racism, capitalism, socialism. Because an ist is a dangerous position. So a pure capitalist, only concerned for capital, will cut down the trees and forget the fish. A pure socialist will yield, as Alexei Yablokov has pointed out, the former USSR, which is now 16% uninhabitable. They call it ecocide. And so you realize that we've been operating between a social market economy, and we're somewhere in the middle here. And that we're trying to meet both of these needs, but nobody's been paying attention to the environment. And so there's a third ism, and that ism is just as dangerous as any other ism, and we call it ecologism. An ecologistic person is someone who says, you must go solar electric. Now, if you're a young family trying to make a living and hopefully spending time with your children, and I come to you and say, you must go solar electric, what am I saying to you? I'm saying you must put a, a blue rectangle on your roof that you don't know how to engage aesthetically, that you have to uh, learn electrical engineering, go negotiate with your local utility, sounds like fun, and, uh, and uh, make a completely uneconomic investment. Go for it. Ecologism. And what we realize is that there is a way to develop solar collectors that don't use gallium arsenide, cadmium, telluride, or copper indium diselenide. Why am I substituting a mass problem for an energy problem? Isn't this great? Let's go solve the energy problem while we produce mass persistent toxification. This is not intelligent design. We're developing a solar collector with NASA that's completely safe. And what we realize is that the design has to honor the whole pro protocol of sustainable development, which is this idea that we have economy, capital, equity, society, and ecology. Um, and so we've developed a, a fractal tool. But this allows us to go beyond sustainability, because sustainability is a demeaned agenda in my book. When I won this award from the president, I'm, I'm, not, I'm the only individual who's won it. There are cities and companies that have won it. Um, but it's because I was the only individual, the press came up and said, oh, Mr. Sustainable, you know. And please, you know, what does it all mean? He's like, remember Mr. Natural? Remember what he said? Anyway, um, he was wrong. It does mean whatever. Um, anyway, um, they came up, so what does all the sustainability mean? I said, I'm not that interested in sustainability. Because if sustainability is the edge between destruction and generation, then it's a kind of a maintenance agenda. Is that interesting? I mean, you know, are you married? If I said, what's your relationship to your wife like? And you said, sustainable. <laughs> I'd say, I'm sorry, you know. I mean, that's not that interesting. Sustainable? We're looking for fecundity here. Let's have some excitement. So what we really need to do is find things that start to merge and, and develop in a way that, that is optimized on every level. So what we've done is create what we call a... Uh, in our index of sustainability. It's a design tool. Um, it's a protocol that includes this fractal as well as a whole chemical uh, and physical strategy. 
and economic strategy. Now, the, the, this is a mnemonic device that we use to help us answer questions. And, and it really is a, it's a fractal. It's a, called the Sierpinski gasket for the mathematicians. And it's self-similar at every scale, as you can probably see. It's a thing made of itself. Isn't that interesting? Nature is very similar at the macro-micro level, a molecular region. So if we go to the lower right-hand corner, we're in the economy triangle. If we want to be 100% in economy, economy, right? It's the economy corner of the economy triangle. What is the question in that corner? Well, the question is, can I make it and sell it at a profit? I'm business. It's pure capitalism. And so what we tell our commercial clients, remember the Guardian Commerce, if you can't make money doing it, don't make it. You'll be undefined. And all the commercial people go, Whew. let's get to work. Why would I want to undefine a business? That's their definition. We have to honor that. 100% profitable. What's the next question? This is the economy triangle, the equity corner. Economy first, equity second. This is a question that Nike deals with very seriously. Are employees earning a living wage? It's not a question of do you make the same here or Thailand. The question is, are people earning a living wage? Economy, equity. If we flip it and go to equity economy, same two characteristics, but now we're in the equity triangle, what would the economy corner of the equity triangle be? It would be equity first. Are men and women being paid the same for the same work? Equity first. The next triangle would be equity, equity. Nothing to do with ecology, nothing to do with economy. The question is, are people treating each other with respect? Nothing to do with ecology, nothing to do with economy. Racism, sexual harassment, things like this. The, the next would be equity ecology, and the question there is, are we exposing our workers to toxins in the workplace? Are we exposing our customers to toxins in our products? The next would be ecology equity, the equity corner of the ecology triangle. And this question has to be, is our factory polluting the air? Is our driving around causing global warming? Are we producing intergenerational remote tyrannies? Ecology ecology would be, does waste equal food? Am I closing my cycles? Do I work within cradle to cradle life cycles instead of cradle to grave? And the next would be uh, the ecology economy corner, which is where we're focused, which is eco-effectiveness. Things that are fecund. Are things tied together into the next industrial re-evolution? Where things make more than they take. Things act like trees. Things are fecund. And then the next would be uh, eco-efficiency. The, the economy corner of the I mean, the ecology corner of the economy triangle. Are we being efficient with our use of resources? This is eco-efficiency. This would be natural capitalism, for example. So that bottom corner is really interesting because I think most of the people have been operating in that lower right corner. This is natural capitalism, eco-efficiency. This is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. This is using nature as a human tool for the human economy. And then the bottom left of the economy triangle would be business for social responsibility, social venture network, for example. Okay? Now, if we take this tool and we start to use it for design, amazing things happen. And so I'll show you first a, a product we designed in uh, 1993. This is uh, six years ago. And it was a, for Steelcase Corporation, uh, design text. And we, we said, let's design, they asked us to design a fabric. And we said, well, we have to design what it looks like. We also want to design what it is. And they said, we figured you'd say something like that. So how's this? Cotton and PET. Okay? Cotton, natural, PET, Coke bottles. Isn't that great? Natural, recycled, got all the buzzwords. Okay, you're the designers. Would you make this thing? Would you make this? Can it go back to natural cycles? Not with PET. Can it go back to the technical cycles? Not with cotton. A product that should not be made. Now, how many people do you think are sitting out there today going, oh, there's one we shouldn't make? I mean, who's actually operating under any principles? And so we realized that we said, look, at, you know, cotton is responsible for 23% of the world's pesticide use. It causes hydrological disasters, and it has never been associated with social fairness. Uh, PET is full of antioxidants, UV stabilizers, and uh, uh, plasticizers and antimony residues from catalytic reactions. It was never designed next, to be next to human skin. If you burn it, you produce antimony trioxide, one of the most carcinogenic things we know how to do. And so we realized that this would create a monstrous hybrid, a product that should not be made. So we decided the first one should be what we call an organic nutrient, biological nutrient fabric. We went to a mill in Switzerland, and when we got there, the head of the mill said, I'm glad you're here because yesterday the trimmings of my bolts of cloth were declared hazardous waste by the Swiss government. I can no longer bury or burn them in Switzerland. I have to ship them to Spain. 
Now you realize you hit the wall of the first industrial revolution when your trimmings are declared hazardous material but you can sell what's in the middle. You don't need to be Einstein to work it out. You're selling hazardous waste. And the notion that we could design with waste equals food, we said, wouldn't it be great if the trimmings of your fabric became mulch for the local garden club? And he got to work, it's a fabulous mill called Rohner Mill, Alvin Kalin, and we designed a fabric made from wool from happy sheep in New Zealand, and Ramey, uh, organically grown in the Philippines, and it wicks moisture away from you, and it's structurally astonishing. It meets all the criteria. But we said, after we figured out the materials, we said, listen, we have to go in and look at the dyes and, and mordants and finishes and polishes and so on. And uh, we went to 60 chemical companies and said, the filters of the future will be in our heads, not on the ends of pipes. Here's the filter. No mutagens, no, no genetic mutations, no carcinogens, no cancer, no teratogens, no birth defects, no endocrine disruptors, hormonal imbalances, no heavy metals, no persistent toxins, no bioaccumulative substances. There is no mother's milk in Germany in a human woman that would be legal to sell on a store shelf. Dioxins. How do you love all the children and put bioaccumulative, persistently toxic material into your mother's milk? Thank God the children's livers aren't functioning when they're breastfeeding. And you realize that our design is creating a kind of intergenerational remote tyranny that is unacceptable and represents negligence in design. And we went to 60 companies and said, who wants to work with us? And nobody wanted to. So we went to Basel. We went, met with the chairman of Siba Geigy, And we said, this is what we want to do. And he said, you're right. And he let us in. And the joke in Basel was they let the hen into the fox house. <laughs> and we looked at 8,000 chemicals in the textile industry, and with our intellectual filters, we eliminated 7,962. We were left with 38 chemicals that were safe. We designed the entire fabric line with 38 chemicals. It won the gold medal at Neocon when it came out the first year. It won it again uh, this last year the new collection, and it, um, it won the highest design award in Europe this last year, along with the Volks, new Volkswagen Beetle. We won the highest environmental award um, in Europe, which was pretty exciting. What we, what we did was actually start to look at criteria where we said, we're just going to stop making cancer. What you wanted was to sit on a piece of fabric, not get fabric and cancer. It's what we call products plus. You get the carpet plus cancer. <laughs> it's like, just give me the carpet. Thank you. you know. So we said, let's get rid of all these pluses. So we did. And then we went after um, the next. We looked at health hazards, disruption of immune system, carrier functions, allergies, toxicities. We studied uh, environmental relevance, biodegradation, fixed toxicities, metabolic pathways, worm toxicity, one of my favorites. Um, production process, exact knowledge of composition, transport distances, was it being animal testing, genetic engineering, what social criteria, climatic relevance, ozone depletion, and so on. And we put all of the molecules, every single molecule through this filter. And this is the other part of the index, which is our materials assessments. And we analyzed every material going into the fabric to make sure there were no excess, and then developed a constant improvement protocol to work within uh, the overall frame. And what you realize is no matter where you, you touch it, uh, you improve the whole thing. And so we developed this fabric, and the marvelous thing, here's the trimming, here it is coming off, here it is being made into felts, and here it is growing strawberries in Switzerland. This is a fabric safe enough to eat. If you have a fiber deficiency, come on up. Imagine that, because you're sitting on fabric and it wears off, you eat it with your lunch. Why shouldn't we be able to design like this? And we're now designing the textiles that go along with the technical nutrient protocols uh, at the, uh, for the next generation. We're also developing business models. I'm now a professor of business, as I mentioned. We're developing uh, a whole protocol for companies on how to report. This is a fully, the first completely transparent business report on the making of things by a company. Every single product, every single chemical is listed. We highlight in red where we feel like we're failing. Uh, we identify how the product is being developed using the protocols. We show all the relevant characteristics, and we show our scoring. We sign the document. And, and we end up with products that's, that are hugely effective. It's, uh, it's very profitable. Uh, and, um, and now they, they have twice as many orders as they can meet, which is the kind of business problem you want. But here's the thing that really strikes me. When 
when the Swiss inspectors came to inspect the water in the factory after they ran our protocol, they thought their equipment had broken because the water coming out of the factory was as clean as the water coming in, which was Swiss drinking water. In fact, it was slightly cleaner because the fabrics were further filtering the water. And when the effluent of a textile mill is cleaner than the influent, which is Swiss drinking water, you realize that you can turn, on the, turn back the pipe. You'd rather use your effluent than influent for process. It's cleaner. And when you get rid of that pipe, guess what? There's nothing to inspect. And when you get rid of that, guess what else? There's no regulation. There is nothing about this fabric that requires regulation. Nothing. Because we're not trying to kill anybody anymore. And the president of the company could get up in front of his people and say, excuse me, I have a small announcement. You can take off your masks. You can take off your gloves. And you realize that in the, even the environmental movement, this efficiency agenda is a terrifying prospect because being less bad is not being good. It's like saying child protection is I'm going to beat my kid five times a day instead of ten. I'm practicing child protection. And what we see on the front page of the New York Times, and it'll say something like, factory workers exposed to car high carcinogen levels unprotected. And then you look at the response of the environmental community, and it says those people should be exposed to cancer, cancer materials, at, at least at OSHA standards. And then the human rights people get up and say those people should be given masks. And you realize from a designer perspective, there are two other questions. Why cancer? Why masks? In architecture, it allows us to make buildings where this is a landscape in Michigan that's being restored as, a, as this native forest, working, starting from a prairie. We're measuring our success by how many songbirds return to the site. The building is fully daylit and full of fresh air. The workers and the office workers and the factory workers share an urbane situation uh, where they all drink the same coffee and have an urban street. Um, Battelle National Lab studied the building for productivity gain based on the idea of biophilia alone, the love of nature. Everybody has fresh air, daylight, and views to the outside. They figure it's worth 1.5% productivity gain, which doesn't sound like much. But when you think that they make $300 million worth of furniture, it's worth $4.5 million a year discounted by the materials that are going into it. They're making about $2 million a year that they weren't making before. It pays the mortgage on a $15 million building. So Herman Miller now says we gave them the building as a present. This is good for my reputation. <laughs> uh, it also won design, uh, Business Week's first Design for Business Award, the best business, bu building for business in America. Um, the, uh, Herman Miller now tells us that the performance in the building is up 24%, and they give us credit for two-thirds of that. That's worth about $25 million every uh, four months. That we've increased performance of the workers here by over $100,000 per person straight to the bottom line. This is good for business. And what we did was give people fresh air and daylight. Most of the productivity gains came from the first two shifts. For the gap, we did a competition which we won against the biggest firms in the country, and we proposed a building where if a, if a bird flying overhead, they wouldn't notice anything had happened. We designed an undulating grass roof that replaces the oak savanna, original oak savanna. We kept the Kirkus agrifolia live oak and replaced all the native grasses. This is the competition model, which was a concept for a building. We said, wouldn't it be great if people felt like they spent their day working outdoors instead of indoors, so the ceiling is the sky. It's like an undulating cloud. And we built it. It's designed to be convertible to housing in the future. And we also realized we could take all sustainability, like politics, as local, and that we could take the local nighttime cool air and run it underneath raised floors, uh, which we'd pay a little more for, but it would allow us to use the concrete mass of the building as a thermal battery, like a hacienda. And we were able to cut the mechanical equipment by over half and provide fresh air to everyone in their, directly in their breathing zone under their own control. And every individual in the building has five trajectories to daylight that they can see, five ways to see the outside, no matter where you sit. So we gave everybody 100% fresh air and 100% daylight. And we heard from the local utility this January that's the most energy efficient building in Northern California, next to one that was designed to be that in uh, Sacramento. And we looked at the other building, and it was designed to have minimum solar gain to minimum for minimum energy and minimum uh, fresh air, so the heat and cool to minimum. Right? And this building was maximum, 100% fresh air, 100% daylight, because people are the reason we're designing these buildings and other species. And people need to see and they need to breathe. Why are we designing buildings for the sake of the building? 
when we, we have windows that open in this building, and the, new, the Wall Street Journal did a front page article about, about me that I designed buildings with windows that open. And I you know, said, latest corporate amenity, buildings with windows that open. And I said to the reporter, Western civilization has just reached a new low point. You know, when a building with windows that opens is news, this is really sick. And so what we realized is that we can celebrate abundance instead of bemoan limits. And we can talk about new kinds of high technology. That is a roof. Right? How, how sophisticated do you think our designs are? How many buildings you know made oxygen lately? Right? How high tech are humans? For Nike, we've just finished this project. We just opened it the other day. And it was really exciting. It was built in less than two years, believe it or not, 300,000 square feet. And the process we used was really interesting. A Dutch developer, which was building a project in which Nike was going, called us up and said, thanks to Nike's instigation, we were put on the list. And they said, would you design a competition, a million square foot master plan and a, a 350,000 square foot building for Nike as a competition? And we said, no, because, and they said, why not? We said, because it's arrogant. Why would we want to design a million square foot master plan in a town we've never visited? And they said, oh. And I said, but in that building idea, that's stupid. Why would we want to design a building for someone we've never met? It's arrogant and stupid. Why would you want to hire anybody arrogant enough and stupid enough to do your competition? And they said, well, how do you compete? We said, that's a good question. We tell stories. Well, we're not going to pay you to tell us a story. Well, you weren't going to pay us to draw either. We tell stories for free. Well, we're not going to pay you to come over and tell us the story. That's okay, we'll pay our own way over. Just let us be last. And when we got over, we explained that we have to see the site, we have to inventory the songbirds, we have to look at the city, we have to engage it as a real place before we can begin, and we have to talk to the clients. And the Nike people were there, and they said, they're right, just do it, and we won the competition. And we went and visited with the city planners of the town and said, what, what are you afraid of? And they said, well, we're afraid you're not going to connect to this Art Nouveau garden. An Art Nouveau garden, I didn't even know such a thing existed. You know, up here, fabulous thing, right? So we said, oh, great, we're going to connect to that. Then they said, we're afraid you're not going to connect to the transit system. We all oh, will extend the platforms over here. That'll work. And they said, we're afraid you're going to have cars everywhere. It's not a car in sight. We're afraid you're not going to honor this great building by Wilhelm Dudok on this track at the top here. We said, we love that building. We're going to put it on access and so on and so forth. He said, here's the deal. We'll do it this way if you present it to city council. Three weeks later, the city planners got up and said, we made them connect to the park. And we're sitting there going, yep. We made them connect to the transit. Sure did. Made them hide all the cars. Absolutely. You know, made them design gardens of native species to attract birds back. Absolutely. Good work, city planners. Approved. A million square feet in Europe. Imagine. Just do it. Great motto. The buildings are, this is a model shot. The buildings are designed to be convertible to housing in the future. The idea is that the Nike will form a community here, that their people will be constantly moving around this great lawn with an arcade with a glass-covered colonnade around it so they can stay out of the weather if, as long as it's not too windy. Um, that uh, the commons is here at the, at the center. There's a gymnasium and, and various uh, food facilities. Here's the Dudok grandstand that we saved. And, and the gardens are all designed as sports gardens that, that recall the species. These are, this is a construction shot just the other day. We took the old harness track and kept the shape and made a running track out of it and took it right over the front door. That's the front entrance. These are the commons. There's a reflecting pool. There's a depression in the middle of the great lawn where they can play volleyball and sports and get together and do stuff or in the winter have skating. This is Hans Brinker land after all. Here it is under construction. For the city of Chattanooga, we work with the city to develop a 120-block master plan for the southern half of the city uh, based on restoring an industrial zone and, and uh, integrating all the desires of the citizens. We brought them together to do their own plans. They developed their own plan. They don't have a shelf, plan on the shelf. They know their own plan. A lot of them came to Portland, by the way, to look at what you're doing here and share. We're designing a new town for utility in northern Indiana. We're, we're working with the chairman to design a town where people don't need cars. I started out by saying to him, you know, we could design a car so the young families only need one car, which will free up another 5,000 a year, which means they don't have to live in a double wider trailer. They can live in a solar powered house that's intelligently designed. And this, this very Republican utility head looked at me and said, you know what I hate about you? You have no imagination. <laughs> he goes, why do they need a car? I like this guy. 
And so we started designing a town where you wouldn't even need a car. And all of a sudden, we're designing new transit systems that use global positioning and information. They deliver goods and services to people. So the poor people live like rich people. This is bourgeois communism's finest hour. Uh, you get your laundry done. And the laundry is done in a solar-powered botanical garden, which happens to be the winter garden for the elders and the children at the daycare center, which happens to be a big public laundry, so that the elders and the children are together at a health, where there's a health clinic. And the laundry being done in this town has zero effect on global warming, zero effect on water quality, and in fact, zero effect on your time if you don't, want to, if you don't like washing clothes. And all of a sudden, you realize that these integrated systems can get quite astonishing, and that a south-facing roof will be leased by the lo local utility for solar collectors because it's properly oriented, and so you can have the benefit of a product of service from your local utility. And it turns out that the power systems are going to be about every three blocks, and they'll involve fuel cells and microturbines and electrical storage devices because we pointed out from a design perspective the telecommunications industry and the, and the power industry are the same industry. They move electrons, and we can send the information as well as power down the lines, and therefore we can also do diurnal arbitrage. We can send down power line prices and say, it's three cents buy, it's 14 cents sell. We can buy and sell on a daily basis, and it moves solar energy up by about six years. We designed all the water systems so that they replicated the ancient prairies where the roots were 16, 16 feet deep, and the upper reaches of the Mississippi didn't have any runoff at all. It was all spring-fed. So we designed the entire system of hydrology to be spring-fed and recharge the string, streams. The water quality in the stream is better with, 50, with 1,200 families than it will, would be with a, as a farm. The steelhead are, are, uh, are returning to spawn. And, um, and we've replicated the ancient forests so that we can start talking about a town that's like a forest where um, we actually uh, become fecund again. This is our latest project. Uh, it's a, a remaking of the River Rouge project, Henry Ford's original plant for the Model A, the largest integrated industrial facility in the world. 90,000 people worked in this one place. Coal and iron ore were brought in at this end, and cars come out the other end. Uh, William Clay Ford, the new chairman, gave us the commission to redo a master plan for this to create the icon of our next industrial revolution. We just received the commission to design a million and a half square foot assembly building for new vehicles uh, within the complex. And we're designing fighter remediation and new kinds of landscaping to restore brownfields, whole new strategies for water, uh, energy, and uh, uh, various flows. For Overland College, we asked a simple question when we opened David Orr's program three years ago, we said, how sophisticated is human design? How many of you as designers could go out in a meadow with your left hand, scrape away a little dirt with your right hand, put something in it that you designed that makes oxygen, sequesters carbon, fixes nitrogen, distills water, provides habitat for thousands of species, makes complex sugars, accrues solar energy as food and fuel, uh, builds soil, changes with the seasons, is delightful, and self-replicates. Honey locust. How sophisticated is human design? Our designs are incredibly primitive. Wouldn't it be wonderful to design buildings that were fecund? For David Orr, we designed a building that makes more energy than it needs to operate. We're developing a new solar collector with NASA that's non-toxic. We've substituted sulfur for selenium. We have a living machine at the entrance to the auditorium, which is a waste treatment plant designed by John Todd so the students can stand and watch microbes and fish clean their sewage while they wait for their lectures. This is an environmental studies center. This is a living machine. This is a sewage treatment plant for 5,000 families. So I'd like to finish by talking about the design of living machines instead of the design of killing machines. And the idea that we might want to use nature as our friend and allow nature to use us as her friend, and that we can honor this sacred thing that we have in us, which is our creativity, our hope, our immortality, and our joy, and that we can understand that certain manifestations of design as taken as retroactive design experiments could be seen as manifestations of hate, and that it is time for us to reimagine our designs as manifestations of love. And that as we engage in that, we realize that it will allow us to allow our future generations, future generations, our children's 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 children, to enjoy and celebrate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness 
free from the intergenerational remote tyranny that is us and our bad design. Thank you very much. I think I can take a couple of questions. I know I went on a little long. Please feel free to run out, especially those of you with kids. Are there any questions? I can't see you out there. Here's. Hello? Uh, completely delightful. The question is, what, what is the cumulative effect of the moisture being put out by fuel cells? It will be a delightful moisture. It's distilled water. Um, I, 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 the, the amazing thing about fuel cells is that they are a pure balancing act in terms of their production if we go to pure hydrogen. What we're seeing, for example, the Oberlin building and a new building we're doing uh, uh, elsewhere will have... Um, uh, fuel cells that are actually using hydrogen generated by solar collectors so that they will become the, f the battery and um, and so it's a pure offset it's direct it's clean it just thanks for your talk tonight um, I've You're welcome introduced the idea that uh, solar power is not really being wasted um, and if we transfer energy use to solar power collection, we're actually taking it away from some of the Earth place. Have you ever had any thoughts on that? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand what you said. Uh, so, uh, so, just the thought of solar power collection as taking it away from another pool of energy that we aren't using, and that maybe we should think more of using less power as opposed to finding another place to get it. Yeah, I think that that's important to understand that we, you know, I'm not gainsaying efficiency at all. And I would say that um, we need to be very efficient with our use of power. And in fact, if we're, if we're going to even begin to talk about solar-driven strategies, it will require us to actually rethink uh, a lot of our engineering strategies to become incredibly effective in order for that to occur. One of the great things about doing a project like the Oberlin project is we gave ourselves such an audacious goal that the building would make more energy than it needed to operate, that we could sit with people, you know, with brilliant people like Amory Lovins and so on, and actually see what the, that strategy implied. And what was interesting is that that building, just because of its roofing surface, could produce 61,000 kilowatt hours a year, and that became our budget. And then when we went and looked at all the different systems to say, where is that energy being used, because we weren't meeting that budget, we discovered that a lot of the pumps and so on were, were even though they're the most efficient pumps, um, we're still where we were in creating our deficits. So we actually redesigned uh, the, the systems of plumbing so that all the pipes were straight and very large so we reduced all the friction losses in order for us to come into that. And what you recognize is that it used to be that materials were really expensive and people were cheap, and now it's the opposite. Um, materials are actually very inexpensive and, and people are the main costs in these things. And so we were able to look at how to design systems um, that are stressless effectively, which brings the energy consumption way down and, then, uh, and, and does the kind of offsets that allow for these strategies to actually work. Is there any source for the plans for the um, North Indiana city that you were mentioning, the Carlos city? Are there any what? Any source for the plans where we could look at the plans and see what it was oh, that you did? Sure. Yeah, you can come to my office. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's described in uh, Judy and Michael Corbett's new book, Sustainable Communities Island Press. It'll be coming out soon. It's called Coffee Creek. It's on the web. It won't be Carlos. That won't happen. It'll... Uh, but you won't have to have a car if you want to live there. 
Do you have any suggestions on how we can begin to implement some of the things that you've talked about tonight? And for example, if you have a developer who does spec office space and there is a real estate broker who tells that developer that you have to do building space, office space in this particular way, what type of tools or te techniques do you go to your clients with to begin to get their thinking in a different direction? We, we use their language. I think one of the things we've discovered is that um, it's very helpful to communicate in someone's own language because then they understand what you're talking about. Um, I remember once we delivered the Hanover principles to somebody and I, I asked somebody, you know, how did, how did he like those principles? He said, well, the guy looked like he was a hound dog trying to read an algebra book. Um, you know, sort of. And some of this stuff is, gets a bit arcane. And so uh, we use the direct language of commerce to explain what we're doing. What we find, for example, in buildings is that if you really look at the cost in buildings, it's, it's all relative to people that are there. And what the, what the sophisticated uh, tenant or owner is, is understanding is that if you actually run some quick numbers, it's quite astonishing what happens. We, we use the direct arguments of commerce. And for example, on an office building, uh, if you build it for $100 a square foot and somebody says, well, you can't spend an extra 10 bucks a square foot making it full of daylight, operable windows, less toxic materials, more delightful, better higher ceilings, put in raised floors, whatever else. And they say, well, you can't afford an extra 10%. We say, well, I don't know what planet you're on, but it's just to run these numbers. If an average employee costs a company between $150,000 and $100,000, and many of these companies, they use 100. So imagine $100,000 a year. If I get a 1% performance gain on that person, uh, it's worth $1,000 a year. If I have a 200 square feet per person and $100 a square foot, I'm, the cost of the building is about $20,000 per person. If I amortize that out over 10 years, it's worth about $2,000 a year per person for the building, right? Now, $2,000 a year, do you give the person software? You know, do you give them a computer? You know, here's the building, $2,000 a year. And now, if I pick up 1% productivity gain, it's worth $1,000 a year, right? If I get, you know what 1% productivity is? It's five minutes a day. Now, how many people, you know, wake up in the morning and go, oh, I can't wait to get to that gray rectangle under that fluorescent light, you know? So five minutes a day is chump change. So if you go ahead and look at it, you realize that if I can pick up one-fifth of 1%, it's worth $200 a year. This pays for the whole building. In fact, you know, that's my 10% right there. If I, get, if I can get one minute a day, I can pay for any of these increases. And what we're seeing anecdotally is our improvements are between 6 and 16%. We pay for the buildings over and over and over again. Because people are measuring the wrong thing. They're focusing on the building. They're not thinking about why we have the building. And I think what you'll see is that the sophisticated clients, once they see these things are possible, they're going to ask for them. And so it's going to become part of the market definition. And it's ultimately chump change in the whole economics of this. And any intelligent company sees this immediately. And if they don't want to see it, then they're what we call mules. And the thing to remember about mules, we have a motto in our office, which is please don't teach the mules to play the violin. It sounds terrible, and the mules don't like it. <laughs> and so the thing to remember about mules is that they're sterile in one generation. Let them go. One more, one more. Yeah, uh, reflecting on your own pathway to this, this profile that you have now, do you remember the first time that you as an aspiring chicken were allowed into the first major fox den? And what motivated the foxes to let you in that first time? That's interesting. I think, I think that, um, I think that the fact that my father was a CEO of a major company. It meant that I got to travel around sort of stealth as a kid and listen to their language. So I think what happens is I'm not threatening to people. Um, David Brower, when he read the Hanover Principles in 1992, called me up and he said, I'll bet it was really tough to translate these into German. And I said, yeah, they were, how'd you know? And he said, well, I know German, and it only has a third as many words as English. And I said, you know, that's really interesting, because we kept sending them out for a translation, and they'd come back, eliminate the concept of waste would come back as, please recycle. 
And I was like, no. And, and he said, what's interesting about you, Bill, is that you can talk to these corporate executives and they understand what you're talking about and you understand what they're talking about, which is really interesting because I don't understand what they're talking about and they don't understand what I'm talking about. And so really it's a question of finding the language that we can all use to communicate fundamental common sense. Because if there's anything that's a reaction to our work, it's either that people pick it up and take it and just take it and use it for themselves and say this is an idea because they, they understand it, they get it, they take it and they use it, or they come back and say this is just common sense. Because it seems to me this is common sense. And so, you know, we're just... We're just trying to do something differently, and I think what's exciting for us is that once you hear it, I don't know about you, but I love cooking this stuff up. And once you do it, like, you can't go back. And boy, is it fun. Thanks so much. <laughs>